Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining me so early today. Um, today we will get started talking about advanced data modeling with Power BI. Will not be a very light session for the first session of today, so I hope I uh, don't get you to sleep directly. Um, first, I will briefly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Mark. I'm a data platform MVP uh, from the Netherlands. Um, working as a data analytics consultant at Macaw in the Netherlands, which is a Dutch Microsoft partner. We basically do everything Microsoft and we implement it at our customers. Um, three year in a row MVP, um, and also besi besides that, uh, recognized as fast rec recognized solution architect. After a year still in name that I have to practice a bit. Um, you can find me on my uh, social channels on LinkedIn, on Twitter, feel free to connect with me. Uh, and I regularly blog about everything Power BI basically. Um, also, I tend to combine my two biggest hobbies together, which is Power BI and beer. You can maybe tell by my voice that yesterday evening was the part with the beer, and now we're talking about Power BI again. Um, so if you like, I got some coasters with me with Power Beer logo on it, because why not combine them together there here, on, here on the front? Grab as many as you want, uh, and also got stickers. So pick them up after the session, and the rest I will drop it at the community zone, so you can also catch them uh, later there. So let's get started with uh, today's session. What we will talk about is we will talk about data modeling. So if we look at the complete aspect of Power BI, we talk about gathering data, uh, cleansing data, modeling, and finally visualizing. Today, we will primarily talk about data modeling, so only the third box in, in this picture. Um, as it is the advanced data modeling session, I kind of assume that you have a basic understanding about a star schema, why is a star schema important in Power BI, the different types of relationships that you can have in Power BI, as well as role-playing dimensions and what that is. If you at least know what it is, that's enough for now. The rest I will explain it to you today. And the primarily topics that we will talk about during this session are explaining data modeling best practices in general. Secondly, we will look at leveraging one and bi-directional uh, relationships and how should you deal with that. Third topic, successfully implement aggregations in Power BI. And as a fourth, work with real life scenarios containing multiple fact tables. And how do you know when to combine them or not? So let's get started with the relationships revisited. Let's do a quick stop at how do relationships work in Power BI and uh, what we should think about and what different types of relationships actually exist. So relationships re revisited. In general, there are three different types of relationships in Power BI. Um, I will briefly, briefly explain them one by one. The first one is the one-to-one -one relationship. So one row on the, uh, the one table matches with one row on the other table. There's always one row uh, in each table. All the way to the right, we have the many-to-many -many relationship. So for example, many students follow many courses. So it's a many-to-many -many relationship. The middle one is the most common one, which is the one-to-many relationship, which is the typical one that you will see when you start talking about star schemas. You have one fact table with, surrounded by multiple dimensions. The dimension is the one side of the uh, relationship, and the fact table is the many side, where many rows uh, relate to one customer. For example, many sales transactions relate to one customer. In Power BI, there's also something that's called relationship direction. And there are two types here. So that is the uh, one directional relationship, uh, where it filters from the one side to the many side. And we also have the bi-directional relationship, where filters will be applied in both directions. This is the first topic that I want to talk about today, is the bi-directional relationships and why this is dangerous. Um, so the relationship direction basically tells you, um, or, or basically can have impact on your end-to-end -end solution in Power BI. Things like uh, overfiltering, or maybe even lead to ambiguity in your data model. So the bi bidirectional relationship can result in surprisingly results in, in your report in the end. I would want to also emphasize that try to avoid bidirectional relationship as much as you can. If you want to have a bidirectional relationship for one calculation specifically, consider to use the cross filter uh, index instead of making the default of the, the relationship bidirectional. With cross filter, you can apply a bidirectional or change the relationship direction just for that one calculation without impact on the rest of your data model. 
So now we're talking about re uh, relationship direction. Let's also have a quick look at what ambiguity means in your data model. Basically, if we start, ta start talking about ambiguity, that means that we have multiple filter paths that lead to the same table. In this example data model, you'll see actually two filter paths. From the bottom table, we can actually see that there's the yellow line going all the way over the top to the same table on the right, while there's also a direct filter applied from the bottom table to the right. Because of this, there is actually a change of the filter context as well. So uh, the bidirectional relationship in this case is from the date table on the bottom to the uh, left-hand table. And over there, the relationship context, the filters that are applied is, are changing um, from the internet sales table to the product table on the top. Um, so what can happen actually with, by, uh, with the ambiguity in your data model? When you start talking about ambiguity, it can lead to unpredictable results. Basically, each of these bars that you see in this chart here um, has a different type of relationship applied and leads to a different result. Um, each of these measures calculates the same but removes one of the relationships in the picture we've just seen. By using cross-filter in DAX, as I just shortly mentioned uh, before, you can change this, uh, this behavior. So this unexpected filter behavior can lead to only showing a subset of data, as we see with the, the year uh, um, or the, the bl dark blue colors. Um, also, you can see that the light blue and the orange brownish one is showing roughly the same. Um, as you can see on the bottom picture, you see that the filter context is changing. So first, the date table on the bottom applies a filter on, based on the dates to the sales. Um, but then the sales table on the left-hand side changes the context to filter based on a subset of products that were actually sold. So from the product table on the top, we have a subset of those sales pro sold products that is filtering the product inventory. But at the same time, we're also filtering based on the dates directly to the product inventory on the right-hand side. So due to that, we show a limited set of data where we should have actually uh, um, have one filter applied. So the bidirectional filter here is between the sales table on the, on the left hand side and the product table on the top. There's also another case where uh, bidirectional filters are likely to be applied and how you can avoid that. So let me demo you that, that in a second. So for the demo, what I'm going to show you is uh, where we have two sl slicers that are not in sync on a report canvas. So let me jump to one of my reports that I prepared for today, which we have here. And apparently, it's not on duplicate mode. Doesn't show. So let me jump to my reporting file here. And as we can see, we have two filters in this report. So we have the sales territory country, and we have the reseller. On the right side, we have uh, uh, the, the sales by year. Um, and basically, in this data model, it's a fairly simple data model. So we have the sales table in the middle, and we have the reseller table on the, on the right, and the sales territory on the left. So what I'm going to do is quickly show you that if I filter by Canada, the, the sales territory, you see that the uh, right-hand visual is directly filtered, as we expect it to be. Well, at the same time, I might want to filter on a reseller, but now it leads to an empty visualization, basically. And this is what we try to avoid, because I only want to show the resellers that are relevant for Canada. So what you can do is, and what is not the best thing to do, is make one of these relationships bidirectional, so that a filter from the sales territory will be applied to the sales table. And that's already happening because the filter direction that we see here. So it's already filtering in that direction. But the filter does not cross uh, the other relationship that we have here, because the filter direction is set from the dimension side, from the reseller, to the fact table. So we can make this relationship bidirectional to solve this problem. And let's see if that works and what the result will be. So we set it here to both. And as soon as we try to do the same thing here again, so we filter on Canada, and we filter on one of these resellers, we see that every reseller actually has some sales. So you could say, problem solved. 
Actually not, because by changing this filter, uh, uh, this filter direction from this relationship, we could have, this could have le led to an amb ambiguous data model, as I've just explained with over-filtering tables. Well, this is a fairly simple data model, but just to explain you how this works. Let me change this relationship back to a sing single relation uh, or single direction as we want it to be. So how are we going to solve this, this challenge? Basically, it's not that difficult. Because what we can do, we are counting the, uh, the sales here in the right-hand visual, uh, or resumming the sales. So what we can do is from the um, sales table that we have here on the right-hand menu, we can simply apply a um, um, visual level filter that will help us um, to only filter down to the relevant resellers. So in the filter pane that we have here in Power BI Desktop, we can apply filters directly. We have the measure here for the total sales, and let me just drop that in here. What we can do now is change the, uh, or apply the filter that it is not blank, or is, for example, is greater than zero. Um, so let's do is greater than zero here, and click apply filter. So if we now filter on Canada, we still see that the other slicer is adjusting. So all the uh, resellers that are shown are relevant for Canada. Same applies when I filter on France or when I filter on Germany. You see the reseller slicer directly adjusting with only the relevant uh, resellers. Basically, we fix the same problem without changing uh, the relationship direction. What's the first demo that I wanted to show you? So let me jump back to the slides. Um, there's something else that I want to talk about to you. And that's basically the relationships in relation to row-level security. When we talk about row-level security, you can apply a filter on a table which filters down all the values based on the filter definition that you set up. By default, uh, the filters will be applied in the same setup as we've sh seen with other tables with re uh, dimensions and facts, where the dimension fills the fact filters the fact table. Um, if we talk about row-level security, there is something that we have to keep in mind um, when we look at bidirectional filters. In this example, we have a uh, row-level security table on the right top, so we'll see that the, the, if we apply all the correct settings, the row-level security filter will filter the country table in the, in the middle top, which will filter the reseller table and, again, the sales. But because of the relationship direction, it will never filter the customer table and the product table and uh, also not the sales territory. Because a row-level security filter by default does not cross a bidirectional relationship, this uh, case will not completely apply. Because as you can see, on top we have a bidirectional filter from, ro from the ro row-level security table to the country table. So what will happen is only my row-level security table will be filters and the rest of my data model will not be filtered if I do not uh, uh, adjust these settings. If you're in your row-level security or in your uh, relationship uh, dialogue in Power BI Desktop, you can sim simply toggle this button on the bottom, which tells you to apply security filters in both directions. Only by t toggling this on, it will uh, pass the, the, the security filter for over a bidirectional relationship, otherwise it will not be applied. So let's go back to the same demo file, and I will show you how this works. So here we are. We have the very same data model. And in this, uh, in this file, we work with uh, a row-level security setup. And let me quickly show you where the, um, what the row-level security roles are. They are fairly simple. So here we see a country where we filter the row-level security table based on the country name. Nothing special so far. If we look at the relationship diagram, let me first move this screen. If we look at the re relationship diagram, it's exactly the same as I've just shown you. Here we have the bidirectional relationship, which is between the country and the, re and the uh, row level security table. If I simply uh, uh, open a relationship, I have not toggled this box yet. So let's see what is happening. In this table here, we have the country table. So let, if, if I apply one of the uh, row level security rules, let, we want to have a look if this country table is filtered down to a subset of countries. So here we have the view as, and we can just switch on one of these rules. Let's do France in this case. 
And we can actually see that the country table is not filtered. So our filter uh, uh, for a row-level security will stop already at the row-level security table. However, if we go back to this relationship diagram and we switch on that, that one toggle to apply security filters in both directions, we can directly see that if we go back to the country table, we only see France now. So if we change the role, for example, to uh, a different country, so let's go for Australia instead of France, we see that it's working. So as a result, by checking this little box in, in the relationship uh, dialog, we can see that the filters that are currently applied are passing over this bidirectional relationship. And as a result, we will filter over this relationship over here. So the reseller table will be filtered as well as uh, we pass it over here to the sales table. It will not filter the customer table and uh, the, sale, the uh, product table and sales territory because these are singular relationships without this, this checkbox toggled. Um, and these the filters will only be applied in the direction from the dimension to the fact side. So that's also something you have to keep in mind when you start working with, um, uh, with relationships in Power BI and row level security combined. Let's now talk about fact tables. Fact tables is the table where all our measurements are stored in Power BI and where all our sales transactions are, for example. In the data model I just showed you, it was the middle table with the sales. But how do we handle multiple fact tables? For example, I got two tables, the internet sales and the reseller sales. What should I do? Well, there are different things that you can do. But I would always consider to uh, up append these two tables together. If you can append them, do it, because that will make your data model easier and easier to understand as you have one fact table and multiple, uh, surrounded by multiple dimensions. In some cases, it is very hard to combine them, especially if there are not so many uh, matching fields. So I would advise you to always create a little mapping table. And this mapping table will help you to understand whether it does make any sense to append these two tables together and introduce a new column which tells you whether it was internet or reseller sales. So with, this, um, um, with these two fact tables that I have, the internet sales and reseller sales, I can already see that there are three columns that are different, where not uh, uh, always is there is a value. So basically for the internet sales, I know that there is a customer, but for the reseller sales, it's not always, uh, uh, we, do, we do not always have the customer number. Similar for the employee and for the reseller. In this example, I would have grouped it or appended these two tables together. So let's have a look how easy you can do that. And we'll do that in our next demo file. So another Power BI uh, data model where we currently have two fact tables. So you, as you can already tell here, the data model gets a little bit messy with a lot of tables and relationships and hard to oversee this. So what we have here on the bottom is here we have the internet sales and here on top we have the reseller sales. But what if I now want to do a sum of my total sales? This will be very hard because I have to create two measures and, uh, and uh, um, actually sum them up together. As a result, I'm overcomplicating my DAX expressions, basically. Um, especially if I want to apply a filter, which then filters only one of the tables, etc. So let's simply apply them and see how this is going to work. Um, in the query editor, we have internet sales and we have the reseller sales. So what I would do is I'm si simply going to the top here, and on top I can click the apply uh, or append a queries button. And I'm going to do that directly. And I'm going to append the reseller sales here. And with that, I, gr I actually append these two tables together, so we have one larger fact table. And in a second, this should show up, if Power BI is with me this morning. Um, but there's one other thing that we should do. Because while we uh, appended these two queries together, there's one other thing that we want to s solve, and that is getting rid of the reseller sales table, because we just combined it. So what we're going to do next is simply do a right-click on the reseller table, and we can uh, uh, disable load, because this toggle here that we see, which is now set to enable load, if we disable this one, it will not be loaded to our data model anymore, but it is still referenced by the internet sales table. So the internet sales table will still have everything together. So let's disable load, and it's now warning me for potential data loss, because it was already loaded previously. Um, so by disabling the load, uh, um, the data will be removed from the end result data model. 
For now, that's fine. So let's just do that. As this thing is still loading, let's assume that it will work, and we just hit the close and apply button. In a second, what will happen is that my uh, reseller sales table on the, on the top will disappear because it's now combined into one internet sales table. And while it's loading, um, we have a much simpler data model right now. It is still called internet sales, so let's also rename it here to just sales. So we have one combined sales table with all the di dimensions that are related to it, such as products, product categories, subcategories, etc. So if I now want to create the sum of my total sales, I only have to look at one table. In order to make this successfully work, there's one thing that you have to keep in mind. Make sure that your column names are matching. In this case, it was already matching, and I could tell that also by uh, looking at the mapping table, as I showed you earlier, um, but that is something that you have to be aware of. If the column names are not matching, make sure that they match first and then uh, uh, append them to, uh, th those two together. So let's build up the complexity a little bit. Let's start about aggregations. Aggregations is a way in Power BI how you can combine direct query really da data, so all the detailed level data um, with imported data on an aggregated level. The benefit here is that your visualizations will run faster if you work with imported data, but not always uh, you need that detailed level in your data model. Well, if you have a million row data set, or maybe even more, um, you want to be able to drill down to those nitty gritty details uh, if you see that your sales is off in a specific month, and you want to know why that happened. So you could consider to put everything in direct query mode, but yeah, that's not a good idea. Um, basically because uh, a direct query will perform slower uh, for the end user, so it will have a performance impact, as well as some, some limitations that apply working with DAX. Um, so let's aim for a balanced architecture where we combine direct query and import storage modes together. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to build an aggregated, level uh, aggregated table, and we let Power BI decide when it should go for the aggregated table and when it should go for... Uh, um, the detailed level table in direct query mode. So what basically is happening is this overview, a query from the, the front end side from the client application being Power BI Mobile or a Power BI Report will hit the query engine. This query engine will decide whether it moves to um, the in-memory cache, so the aggregated tables that we imported, or it will fire the query over direct query to our data source on the right hand side. Before we're, before we're going to de deep dive in this solution, and uh, I'm going to show you how this works, there's one other thing that we have to understand. In Power BI, we can talk about three different storage modes. It's import, it's direct query, but there's also dual. And with dual, actually, the table can behave either in direct query mode or in import mode. These different storage modes are important to understand when we have a look at the relationships again. There are also two different types of relationships, which is the regular and the limited relationship. A limited relationship has some implications in Power BI. So we have to make sure that we aim for the regular relationships. But why? Well, a relationship is limited if it crosses a source group. So for example, if we go from uh, an imported uh, Excel sheet to a uh, SQL uh, database, or if we go from VertiPack, the imported data, to the direct query source. Also, limited relationships uh, uh, is what we have when we have a many-to-many -many relationship. That's also an important one, or, or a limited one. So, how do we avoid this? Well, by applying this dual mode to all the related, uh, related ta tables that we have from the uh, aggregated table, so from the direct query table, um, we, have, we should put all the related dimensions on dual mode. So when we hit the direct query table, it can behave like a direct query table. And when we hit the imported table, it behaves like an imported table. This is important because if we go back one slide, we can see that dual tables uh, work with dual tables best, imported works with import or dual, and direct query works best with direct query or dual. So then we talk about regular relationships. Um, Another impact of limited relationships is that, again, we have to toggle this button for the row level security if we talk about a many-to-many -many relationship. Something else that we can talk about is that the related DAX function 
will not work um, w and we cannot re retrieve the data from the one side of the relationship in, in case we have a limited relationship. Also, you might have seen this before that you have a blank row in your table. If you b build a table in Power BI where, let's say, you have five resellers from your dimension, but the fact table has 10, then you have a blank row which basically sum sums up all the all the other resellers where we don't know what the name is. This only works with uh, regular relationships because we do an outer join there. There's an outer join performed between those tables. If you have a limited relationship, it will by default be an inner join, which means that you only show the data related to uh, um, the resellers where we did find a match in the reseller dimension. Because of this, we are, might be showing incomplete data as we're just missing out on all these others which are not represented in our dimension table. So let's jump into another demo and I'm going to show you today how you can build an aggregation in Power BI. So we jump to uh, another Power BI file here and everything in this case is set to directory mode. And we can tell by all the blue bars on top of all these tables. Each table that is in directory mode will have this blue bar on top. Also, if we just se select one of the tables and we go in here in the uh, uh, storage mode, we can see it is currently set to directory. It's a fairly simple star schema here um, with the internet sales in the middle and uh, it is surrounded by various uh, dimensions. So let's do one thing and just directly uh, create one of the aggregated tables that we want. At this moment, each individual transaction is in our internet sales table, but let's create a second table. So we're going to duplicate this one. Um, so here it is, duplicate. And we're going to call this one sales aggregation, so sales ag. Because we want to match this sales aggregation table to one of the other uh, dimensions, um, we have to also apply a, a grouping here. Under completely to the right hand side, we also see all the related dimensions. So we have the currency table, the customer table, et cetera, et cetera. In this case, we want to group it to the uh, product category. So we have to get the product category key as well. So let's first get that value in here. So we have the category, product, well, subcategory key should be fine. So here we go. So in a second, here we have the sub product subcategory key. And let's now create our grouping. So in the transform data section here on top, we have the group by. So what we're going to do is we're quickly going to group this data. And what we're going to do is we do a count of rows because then we can at least see uh, how many rows we have. And we, we do it in advance. So we also want to have uh, the sum of uh, internet sales, for example. Where is it? Where is it? Sales amount, the sum of sales amount. But we want to apply a grouping as well. So we currently group by product subcategory key, but maybe we also want to group by things like the customer key because we want to keep that one. And let me have a quick look at what other groupings I had to apply. Oh, let's do it by calendar year as well. Oh, we already got one. Uh, I should have created a calendar year before. Let me see where it is. So somewhere here we should also have the dim date. So here's the order key and let's get the uh, year here as well. So we got fiscal uh, calendar year. And now we're going to do the grouping again. So we do it in advance. We do it based on the calendar year. And we want to group also on the subcategory key that I just added. And we do a count of rows. And we want to have the sales. So we do a sum. Where did my mouse go? Here it is. The sum of sales amount. So this grouping is fine for now. And while this one is loading, there we go. It's a fairly simple uh, um, table for now. So let's just cl click close and apply. 
this table still set to uh, direct query mode. We're going to change that in a second because our goal was to combine the direct query and the imported table and get the best of, out of both. So let's see where our table now is. Somewhere here, sales aggregation. And we're going to combine that. So first create some relationships with the calendar year that we have here. But also, uh, it's a single relationship, so that's fine, yes. But also with the product subcategory, so we have the product subcategory key. Here it is. And we're going to create a relationship here as well. Yes, also a one-to-many relationship. So far, nothing special. We just added the second table to the data model. Something what we're going to do now is define the aggregation. So when we do a right click on this table, we can say manage aggregation. And in the manage aggregation dialog, we have to create some sort of mapping. So here we can define that the calendar year is actually a group by of the table calendar year and the field calendar year. The product subcategory in this case is a group by of the, um, or is it product subcategory and then the value product cat subcategory key. Um, and I might have messed up somewhere, but let's see. Mm. Okay. Um, the last thing that I have to do is to quickly define that this is actually the sum and in the sum of, of internet sales. And I think that is where it went wrong. It should be internet sales because it's a group by of internet sales. Um, and this was the calendar year, which is not in here, obviously. So this should be date calendar year. What I will do is quickly to make sure that everything is working, I will already open the result file for you. So I can at least show it successfully working. Um, aggregation final. Well, I'll continue to explain what this is uh, about. So, um, so here we defined a grouping. And after we did that, um, there's one other thing that we have to do. Um, basically, we have to change the, the storage mode because it's still on direct query. So when we define the aggregation, uh, we have to tell Power BI to change the storage mode to import. Um, so in this data model, I already set up the aggregation. And as you can see here, we have internet sales aggregated here on the right bottom. And here the storage mode is set to import. Let me quickly pull up that, aggreg that uh, manage aggregation window again. So here we go. So we have a count, which is the count of table rows. We have the order calendar year, which is a group by of calendar year. And we have the product subcategory, which is a group by of the, uh, the product subcategory. Also, we have the sum of sales amount, where uh, we actually show the, the uh, sum of the sales amount from the internet sales table. The next thing that I want to show you here is that uh, we will hit either the imported ta table or the aggregated table, or the, the direct query table, when we drill down to a deeper level of granularity. So in this left-hand visual, we have the sales amount uh, by English product name. So product name is a fairly deep level of granularity. So let's go up first. And we now show it by category name. As soon as we define the aggregation, Power BI will actually ask us that, this, uh, uh, that there is an aggregated table and if it needs to set all the related tables to dual mode. The dual mode is what we can uh, see here by the dashed rows, uh, the dashed bar on top of these tables. So it can behave either in import mode or in direct query mode. So now I want to actually see whether I'm hitting my aggregated table or my direct query table. And I'm going to do that by using DAX Studio. So one of the external tools that we can pull up here from the top ribbon is DAX Studio if you got it installed. And with DAX Studio, we can run a trace to see all our queries that are running through our data model. So in the top ribbon here, we can select all queries. And while this trace is starting, yes, trace has started. Um, I'm quickly going to uh, also pull up the um, performance analyzer in Power BI. So I can just refresh my visual rendering on the screen right now. So I click Refresh Visuals, and you'll see that everything is basically already done in just 450, roughly 450 uh, milliseconds. 
In Power BI or in Dex Studio here, we can see actually a few queries that are executed. We see the, the balls on in front of each query where we can, uh, Power, Dex Studio is telling us whether it hit the aggregated table or the direct query table. This query in this case uh, did hit the aggregated table. Um, and this open ball here shows us that it, it didn't hit the aggregated table, so it was executed over direct query. So let's go back and drill down to a deeper level of granularity from product category, uh, category name to uh, a subcategory. Still, we see a new query that still hit our aggregation, which is also what we expected because we grouped by on the subcategory level. Let's now drill down to product level and see what it will do then. So we'll kind of uh, deep dive in the road bikes category and we want to drill down to all the individual products that we sold in this category. We have a list already on the screen right now, and as we can see here that the query took a little bit longer, uh, roughly 650 uh, milliseconds. In Dex Studio, we can see that it did not hit the aggregation. So let's see what happens when we uh, try to execute the same query here, but not on all queries, but we can want to see what is the query that is executed to our database. So this is the DAX expression coming from Power BI that was executed. But let's run the same query now again, but then without cache and with the server timings option enabled. So the first thing that we see here is that the attempt failed. So it tried to find one of the aggregated tables, but it couldn't find it. So it didn't work. So we see the direct query uh, uh, SQL expression here that was sent from Power BI to the direct query table. But what if we pick one of those queries that did hit the aggregation? So let me replace this one, or pick this one from the all queries tab, because we already noticed that it did our, hit our aggregation, and execute the same one again. And in server timings, we can see that the match was found. And it's also telling us that it's mapped the measure on the internet sales table to the internet sales aggregated table, because it was already uh, available to us on an aggregated level. Going back to our data model for a second. Um, so here's the aggregation final file. Um, what is happening is that we only defined a measure in our internet sales table and we have completely hidden the aggregated table. We don't want to see that in our data model. Power BI decides for us whether the data is available in this aggregated table or not and whether it should send it to the direct query table or not. Um, this is what is happening for us on the back end. We don't have to do that ourselves, but the only thing we have to do is defined at aggregation level um, that we have here in the Manage Aggregation dialog. Let's go back for the, to the slides for the final few slides. So far, we talked about what we call user-defined aggregations. We, as a user, defined what is the aggregated level uh, of this uh, table, and we defined it in the dialog. There's also something called automatic aggregations where the exact same concept applies, but then Power BI is, is building this aggregation for you. This is a Power BI Premium feature, and in Power BI Premium, um, you can enable this in your data set settings. The, the aggregation level will be defined based on the query telemetry that is saved for you and captured by, uh, by Power BI for the past seven days. Then there are some uh, algorithms running on top of that which will help you uh, or will help to define the most optimal aggregated level that it should import into your data model. In the preview state at this moment, there are four supported data source types, which is Azure SQL, Azure uh, Synapse, uh, Google BigQuery, and Snowflake. Um, but it, it is expected that these supported data sources will be broader as soon as this feature will hit uh, general availability. Once again, this requires Power BI Premium, but any type of premium is possible. So it can be a premium per user, a premium capacity, or an embedded capacity. Let's do a quick wrap up of everything that I've told you today. One of the things that is most important in Power BI is keep your data models as simple as possible, but aim, always aim for a star schema. Um, if you cannot build a star schema, you have some, uh, uh, some dimensions related to, to other dimensions. We can talk about a snowflake schema, which is still OK. Be, care be careful with leveraging bidirectional relationships, especially as this can lead to an ambiguous data model or overfiltering, as I've explained to you. If you want to filter sli uh, one slicer by the value from another slicer, use the simple trick to apply uh, uh, that the measure is not equal to, to zero in the filter pane. Avoid ambiguous data model always, 
and consider to only apply bidirectional filters by using cross-filter index. And consider leveraging aggregations to help you with big data analysis, to import data on an aggregated level and only hit direct query with an, a, a, a small set of data that you want to deep dive in. And be prepared to how to deal with multiple fact tables. If you can, group them together and to ease this process, create an easy mapping table. Based on everything that I've showed you, there are some resources that I want to share with you, um, which are currently on the screen, but I will also share my slides later on so you can easily copy paste the URLs of all these resources. Um, especially the one that I really uh, want to point out here is the white paper about bidirectional cross filtering for Power BI Desktop, which is going through this whole concept and explaining you um, um, the how and why this is difficult or important to understand and how you can overcome it. In case you want to review all this content, this is actually content from a webinar series that I recorded together with Jeroen Teheert, who is a program manager on the Power BI team. We recorded three episodes on data modeling, of which this was the second episode. All the links are available, uh, or all these links uh, will lead you to the uh, page where you can review those webinars. After registration, you will can, can view those webinars for free. Um, with that, I want to round off this presentation. Thank you for attending. And uh, if there are any questions, please feel free to ask them. And do not forget to provide some feedback. I see that the QR code is not working, but the uh, uh, URL is on the, uh, on the slide. So the question is, when I did the union between internet sales and reseller sales, what was it that I needed to distinguish those two at a later moment? I would say create uh, an additional column in the both uh, original tables. So you create a column with, uh, let's say, sales type, um, where you put in uh, uh, a one for internet sales and a two for reseller sales. And as soon as you append these two tables, you can create a new dimension, which allows you to filter that table for only reseller or only internet sales. So you'll create one additional column in that table. OK. Yes, to the right. So. So you want to combine the two fact tables? It's not possible to combine them. They're not compatible when you do the comparison. Yeah. Um, but you do actually need them for what's in the report. Yeah. Do you look to use the same dimensions against the two fact tables, or do you look to make a relationship between the fact tables? OK. So the question is, what if I cannot append my two fact tables together? Should I then? use the same dimensions and link them all to the fact table, or shall, should I uh, create a relationship between the fact tables directly? I would aim to create the relationships to the dimensions, and reason why is that most likely between the fact tables you will create a many-to-many -many relationship, which will be a limited relationship. If you do it with the dimensions and you apply a filter, for example, I only want to see the year 2022, then it will filter both the tables directly. And if it is a many-to-many -many relationship between both fact tables, there is a risk of changing the filter context because you first filter on year and then maybe the relationship between both fact tables is based on something completely different. Okay, there was also a question next to you. So if there's any timeline available when these features come available for Power BI service, uh, Server on-premise, not that I'm aware of. Uh, everything that I showed you with the relationship, everything that applies in all the cases. The aggregations, I'm not sure if that is on the roadmap for uh, on-premise. I haven't seen it, to be honest. Okay. Any other questions? No? Questions? Someone yeah? just mentioned that you used an external tool within one of your Power BI reports, right? Mm -hmm. So they just want to see that again, if you can display that slide. Uh, so the question is if I can display a slide again about an external tool and... You had an external tool ribbon in one of your Power BI 
Yeah. So they just want to see that again on screen. Ah, okay. So if they can see Dex Studio again. Okay. Let me close this slide. The tool that I use here is Dex Studio, which you can download for free from the internet. And with Dex Studio, you can run the traces. So first, I did the all queries here on the top ribbon, um, where you see all incoming queries from your visuals to your engine, to the, the engine where your data model is running. And with server timings, you can find out more about the queries executed from Power BI to the downstream data or upstream data source. Uh, if I will be sharing the demo files afterwards, I can do that because everything is based on the AdventureWorks data set, which is uh, a data set you can download from the internet. Um, links to those data sources were also in the slides, but other than that, I will make sure that I upload everything to my GitHub repository where you will find the slides as well as the demo files. Um, I think in Power BI Desktop, did you use the external tools ribbon? So the question is whether I use the external tools ribbon in Power BI Desktop. Yes, I did. So that's what they want to see now. Ah, okay. So let me go back to Power BI Desktop. Uh, here we have it. In Power BI Desktop, there is a top ribbon here, which where I have a lot of external tools, but maybe you only have one or two of them or not at all. Um, these external tools is what you, oh, I think for 99%, they're all free and you can download them from the internet. Um, there's one tool that I would advise you to use in this case, which is the Business Ops Installer, which allows you to install all of these in one go. Um, you can download that from powerbi.tips. Free marketing here. <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank you again, and if you have any questions, feel free to walk by. Uh, I still have the coasters and stickers here up front. Grab as many as you like, and everything that's remaining, I will drop it at the community zone. Thanks.